ugly Lagrange example, as promised. So here's some goofy cubic surface, right? And I want to find the um, max and mins that this can have on the unit circle, right? Restricting our inputs to the unit circle. And um, here, what's nice is we can we can accomplish this without even really graphing the surface. We can find the max and mins using Lagrange multipliers. So, so how do we implement this? Well, what's the system of equations that we want to solve? We want the gradients of the um, surface, the objective function, right? And the constraint to be parallel. We want those to be parallel to each other. We also want the constraint itself as one of our equations. Right? So this is going to give us a system of three equations of three unknowns, right? Now, x, y, and lambda are the unknowns. Three equations, three unknowns. And where do they come from? The gradient package is both the x partial, right, the x partials and the y partials. So calculate those, write them down, right? Um, so that's why the, the one gradient equation unpacks into two regular equations, right? Um, so now I have three equations on three unknowns. Um, here, this is a little bit more challenging than our previous example that we looked at because in our previous example, we only had, we had a linear system of three equations on three unknowns, right? Um, here we have nonlinear system, right? There's an X squared, there's a lambda times Y, there's an X times lambda, right? These are all, there's X, the X squared, Y squared, right? These are all, a mix of three one terms, three two terms, right? So there's no um, general method for solving a nonlinear system of equations that's you know, algorithmic and guaranteed to easily succeed and all that, all the wonderful things that we have for linear systems. Um, so instead, you have to you have to really just look at what's in front of you and say, what's going to be the easiest thing to start with? Um, you know, sometimes dividing the first dividing the two equations by each other. Sometimes that's a nice way to go because it can eliminate lambda, right? And we don't really care about the, you know, as long as lambda is not zero, if you divide those, right? So sometimes that's a good way to go. Um, here, you know, I think the nicest thing to do here is just notice that that second equation is a little bit simpler than the rest of them. Um, so I want to start with that one and see what I can get from it. Right, so what could I conclude from that second equation? I could say that here, these two quantities can only be equal um, under what conditions? Well, you could have y equals zero, right? Because then the left and right hand side are both zero. So we're gonna call that case one, so be y equals zero. And then um, what else could make them equal? They could be equal because, lambda equals one, right? Then you just have two y equals two y. So that's a nice way to look at that, that equation. Um, so, yeah, or both, right? These are not necessarily mutually exclusive cases, right? So, so I think that's a good a good place to start in this analysis, right? So um, case one, if we have y equals zero, what, what um, points do we get out of that? Well, that's going to force, and we can plug that in here, and then that's going to force x to be plus or minus 1, right? Um, so we get two critical points out of case, right? We get 1, 0, and minus 1, 0, right? Those are our two critical points from that we get from y equals 0. Um, I can then look at case 2, right? And in case two, what do I have? If lambda equals one, well, then I could take that value and plug it in here, right? And solve for x, because now it's just a regular quadratic involving x, right? So I get this equation, which becomes 3x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. And I don't even need the quadratic formula for that, right? I can actually factor that in that case, right? So I get x as. So x would be one or x would be negative one third. Okay. Um, now I do still need y, right? I do still need y. 
So let's take these and plug them into the third equation, the, right? The unit circle equation. Um, so if x equals one, then in the unit circle equation, we get this, one squared plus y squared equals one, which means y equals zero. But I actually don't need to get to write down that point as a separate point because we already found that, right? That's one comma zero. So here we're, we don't land upon a new critical point to toss into the mix, right? Um, so that's that's fine, right? We found this point kind of twice, just how the algebra worked out. Um, but that's okay. The second case, the x equals minus one third, that's really going to be a new, going to give us new critical points, right? So plug that in to our unit circle equation, right, to get one ninth plus y squared equals one. So that gives us that y equals um, two root two over three or negative, right? Negative two over three. Right, so this gives me two more critical points. Right, so I have, <laughs> I'm gonna have two more critical points. I have the x value is negative one third in both of those. Right. And then the y value is two root two over three or negative two root two over three. So these are four four boxed uh, answers here. Right. These are the four points that we got. And you know what? I should say, really say critical points. They're not critical points in the sense of um, of both partials equaling zero. There are just points where the level curve, um, where the gradient, the level curve is parallel to the gradient of the of the objective function, right? Or the surface gradient, and or sorry, of the constraint, right? The constraints gradient is parallel to the level curve's gradient, uh, which is a critical point, right? If you want, sometimes people call them Lagrange points. You can call it a Lagrange point if you want. Um, but there, there isn't super standard terminology for it, like, like critical, like there's a critical point. Um, but they're the, they're the, they are the four points that Lagrange multipliers hands to us as potential max and min. Right? Uh, that's I think the nicest way to say it. Right? So, um, so now to find which are maxes and which are mins, um, let's just plug it into the original function, right? And we'll get actually a sense of what's going on. So. Right, let's calculate now the corresponding z coordinates. Right, so if I calculate the corresponding z's, what do I get? I have z equals for one zero, right? I have my back from my original formula, I have one cubed minus one, right? And then I have zero squared. So just get zero. Um, and similarly for negative one zero, right? I get negative one cubed minus minus one plus zero squared also gives me zero. Um, then if I plug in the, the others, the negative one third, two root two over three, right? You plug those in and You want, you can get exact values for those. I'm gonna fast forward that and just give us a decimal approximation here. Um, just a decimal out to two digits. Um, these are gonna be 1.19, right? So we'll the 1.19. Right, yeah. which again, you can get an exact value if you wanna plug in and simplify. But here for, for our purposes here, the decimal approximation. So, um, so what is happening here? These are the min values that we're getting, right? These are the mins along that unit circle, and these are the maxes. Um, and how can I how can I see that? Well, think about here's where where we do have to peel the graph a little bit. Um, so think about what's happening here. We're saying that here's x, here's y, and here's the unit circle, right? This is this is our constraint G, right? This is x squared plus y squared equals one. And then the surface, 
f of x, y is assigning a z value to every point on this, right? So what I'm getting is here and here, I'm getting z equals z, right? So those are the z values I'm getting at those two points, right? So, and then I have at these two points, negative one third, right? X equal negative one third, comma, two root two over three, and X equal negative one third, comma, negative root two over two, root two over three, right? That's where I'm getting my max is I'm getting a Z equals 1.19 and Z equals one point. Right. So here I have a min, a max, a max, right? And uh, here I don't have, I am appealing a little bit to, to geometric intuition, looking at how the Z values compare to each other, right? Not, uh, there isn't a formal test like a second derivative test really to use on this, like there was for, um, you know, for, for ordinary critical point analysis, like a discriminant test. Right. There isn't really a corresponding test here, um, but it, the graph, you can kind of see what's what's going on. If you take this and put it, you know, here in the x, y plane, right, and you imagine this, this unit circle as our domain, right, and you say, what is, how do I know that these are mins and maxes? Well, because essentially I'm seeing this point, this point, right, as those min values that we found. And then here at this point, I'm getting this height 1.19. And here at this point, right? So these are the other points. Getting this point also at height 1.19. Right. So, so you get this kind of roller coaster track, right? It starts down at the bottom here. It's going to climb up, 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 up to that max, right? You can imagine it. Climbing up there, right, until it hits that max z value. Right, and then it's going to descend, 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 right, until it gets to this min down here on the on the axis, right? At which point it climbs back up a while until it gets to the max, and it's going to descend, descend, descend. Right until it comes back around me. So you get the you get this nice yeah roller coaster track like shape right um, right that this has two means at equal height and then two maxes of equal height right so it's just it's a nice little it's going around in a circle but as it goes around in the circle it goes it's up and then back down and then up and back down right so uh, that's the the shape that we're dealing with here. Okay, so there we go. So there's our, um, there is our kind of messier Lagrange multiplier problem as promised, right? Uh, a nonlinear system, right? Now, um, what's nice is you can actually combine this sort of analysis um, to look at a kind of corresponding, Generalization of the extreme value theorem, right? In, in California, you may have seen the extreme value theorem, uh, which said a continuous function, right, f on a closed interval a, b always attains an absolute max, an absolute min, right? And then you, and then you develop this algorithm to find them, right? What do you do? You uh, you compare critical points and endpoints, right? So you, this is one of the kind of standard algorithms in calculus. Right? The critical points you find by taking the derivative and setting them equal to zero, right? The endpoints you just look at, you just plug in a and b, right? You look at f of a, you look at f of b. And that's it, right? This is the extreme value theorem. And and kind of the, the sort of the calc one version of the extreme value theorem, right? Um, 
So this is one of the, you know, one of the standard algorithms, theorems and algorithms that you learn in Calc 1. Here, what's cool is we get kind of a surfaces version of this, right? So in, in Calc 3, you can do, again, extreme value theorem, but now instead of, you know, instead of working in plane, right, now we're kind of working in three space, right? And what you can say is that a continuous surface, right? So instead of having instead of having an interval as a domain, you have some region in the plane, in the xy plane, right? Some domain D as your, your domain. Um, you can say a continuous surface always attains its max, an absolute max, and right, absolute max and min on D. Um, and the, the really tricky thing to to stating this is you have to say that D is closed, is a closed set. Um, in in one D, it's a lot easier to say because the only closed sets in one um, one dimension in this context um, that we need to think about are are closed intervals, right? Um, so you just say closed interval A B, right? Um, here it turns out it's actually it's actually extremely difficult to define. Like, what's the right notion of a closed interval? How do you generalize that to a, a, a two-dimensional set? Um, and this is exactly, so the right definition of this word comes from um, topology, comes from the branch of mathematics known as topology, to define closed, what is a closed set in general? You know, how do you generalize the idea of a closed interval? And um, so in, uh, for our this would be a huge detour for calc three. Um, you take calc topology some day, you'll you'll do that detour. It's a lot of fun. It's very interesting. Um, but uh, for our purposes, what you can think of it as is just you know, in the context of calculus, usually you can just say that it is a set that contains its boundary. Um, where I'm, again, I'm not going to define boundary super carefully, um, but basically just imagine that D, instead of it being, you know, some region where it's just the interior and it's missing the the edge, right? That D also includes its, its edge, right? Um, and D also has to be back, right? So this is this is kind of just like saying that up here A and B are not allowed to be infinity; they have to be real numbers A and B. Um, so found that I think it's a little easier to define in, in, in this context in calculus, right? It just means that it, um, it you know, it has, there has to be some circle of finite radius that you could contain the whole set in, right? So, okay, so this is our extreme value theorem in Cal 3. Now, the question is, of course, okay, this theorem just promises that such a surface will have an absolute max and will have an absolute min on that domain. Um, but just like the one in Calc 1, it doesn't really tell you how to find it. Um, but what turns out is, you know, just like you had things to check up here, where could a max or min occur? Where could absolute max or min occur? It could be a critical point. Um, or I should include non differentiable, or it does not exist. So it could be at a critical point or at an endpoint. Um, there are also two things you can check down here. So you can check for critical points. Again, right, that is the same um, on the interior of the set, right, by not only setting the, the one derivative equal to zero, but both derivatives equal to zero, right? And then you use discriminant to classify, right? But just like up here that you might, you know, then use um, second derivative test, right? The same thing here. You want to 
take your partials to get the solve critical points and then classify with the discriminant, right? Now, what about this idea of plugging in endpoints? Well, now, see, in Calc 1, it was fine because there were only two endpoints, A and B. But now there are infinitely many endpoints. There's a whole curve of endpoints. Oh, well, that's what Lagrange multiplies. It finds maximums of a surface with constraints as such. So kind of curve, right? So then also use Lagrange multipliers right to find find max and mans on the boundary right so this is that step of checking in points where you plug in a and b back in calculate has become a lagrange multiplier right so that so the the critical points part is not too much harder but the plugging the, the endpoint testing got way harder right now instead of just looking at those two numbers you have to actually do this whole lagrange multiplier so uh, so that's how to how to find the nexus and means that are promised by the extreme value there. um let's do an example and we're going to conveniently do an example where we already completed the Lagrange part of the trick. So let's find the absolute max and absolute min of the surface f of x, y equals x cubed minus x plus y squared, right? So the same surface that we just were using up here, right? Exactly the same path from up there, um, right? On the domain, which will be closed in value um, on the domain x, y, such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. Right? So I'm saying consider this disk, D, right? So not just the boundary, like you do in a Lagrange square, but consider the whole disk, D. And now the biggest and smallest z coordinates that the surface ever attains on D. Right, that's our, our idea. Um, so I, the endpoint part is done, right? The you know the boundary, right? We already tested the boundary, which was x squared plus y squared equals one, um, was already tested before. Because that was the Lagrange calculation that we just did, right? So there we had the max values were we're at these these points one point one nine yes right so it was at that point and the same point with the negative y. Here we go. Um, so that's boundary, right? Um, then we'll be, oh, oh, and we have the mins, right? The mins at, we're at one zero, one zero zero, and minus one zero zero. Um, but what we have to do is we have to test the interior, right? Because it could be that these are the biggest and smallest point, z values, or that we already found on the boundary. And maybe everything in the interior is just in between. Or maybe there's a higher Z value or a lower Z value on the interior. So let's let's test this. So how can I do this? Well, take your partials and set them equal to zero. Right? This is how we'll find our critical points. So what do I get here? I get 3x squared minus 1 equals 0 or 2y. So these are the, the partials. So what does this give me? This gives me that x equals um, plus or minus 1 over root 3 and y equals 0. Right? These are the, the two critical points that I get. So I get so 1 over root 3, or if you want to simplify that a little bit, root 3 over 3, comma 0, and minus root 3 over 3. Zero. Right, these are the points I get, at, the critical points I get on in the interior. Um, let's do a discriminant test, right? So let's do our second derivatives. 
So I have fxx is 6x, fryy is 2, right? And then fxy is 0. So my discriminant is 12x minus 0 squared, right? So 12 is my, my discriminant. Right? Um, so now I test each point there. So at root three over three comma zero, D is four root three, right? It is positive. So I get to use my calc one and concave, concave convex test, right? So I get F X X at that same point is going to be two root three, right? Which is positive. And a positive second derivative implies min. So that point is going to be a min. Then I want to know at, but at negative root three over three, comma zero, there my discriminant is negative four root three, right? So we have a, right? I don't need to continue with the second derivative with respect to x, right? Negative discriminant. Oh. So this, right, this point. Um, so I don't really need to worry about this one as far as maxes of being go. But this one could be a new, it, it, I know it's definitely a local one, at least from this analysis, but it could actually be the absolute. Yeah. So let's check and see. How would I see? Well, test its z value, right? So find the z value of this point. And if we plug this in, um, again, and just get, you know, a rough, just, you could get it exactly, but I'm just doing a rough calculator estimate because it's enough for our purposes. We get negative point three eight. This is smaller <laughs> than other means that we have, right? In this one and this one, they had z values of zero, right? This is a new absolute mean. It's the new smallest z coordinate. That we found right, so this negative 0.38, right? That's going to be the absolute min of a surface on this, right? On that interval of this region, right? Uh, so, there we go. Now we have some sense of what is happening here. I mean, I have uh, if you if you look at this from top down, right? You have the uh, um. Right, you have the, the absolute maxes occur um, here. You have two times for absolute maxes. Right, this is going to be this is going to be absolute max. This is going to be absolute max. Right, and then the, the absolute min actually occurs at um, to root three over three, right, which is uh, point, point six ish, right? Point six or so, um, give or take, and uh, comma zero at this point right there, right? That's going to be an absolute min. Just be z roughly negative zero point three eight, right? So, so if you're thinking about what this looks like as a graph, you know there were these local mins here on the boundary, but they weren't the absolute. Right, they ended up. Um, there ended up being a point on the interior that is actually lower than anything on the boundary. Right. So the you know if we were going to add this to our graph here, where we had the up here we graphed the maximum is just on the boundary. Right, the absolute man would be like down here. At this right it would be this point with the z equals. Um, you know it would be this point. Uh, root three over three, zero, negative 0 0.38, right? That would be the absolute minimum of the surface. So the surface kind of sags down in the middle there, right? And that's the absolute lowest point. You know, that would be the bottom of this valley it would come up on all sides from there to connect into this roller, or roller coaster. But these peaks of the roller coaster, those are absolute, the absolute maxes of this surface on that region. Okay. So there we go. So there's an uglier Lagrange example, and uh, 
using it not only by itself, but also in conjunction with the discriminant test and critical point analysis that we saw before. Great. Hope you enjoyed.